the idea that it would be lovely to do some kind of work together. It was November 2013 and um, we had already decided that we wanted to go and do a residency on Comey. Um, so the five of us had booked a house which had two studios attached to it um, and the plan was to go out there, some of us for the first time, um, and stay for four nights and work intensely for four, those four nights and really just soak it up, um, explore the island, take notes, take photographs, um, a, like, a, like a research trip really in a way. Um, we made a lot of work whilst we were on the island as well and then the idea was to bring that back to the mainland and use it as the catalyst for this show. It was incredible just to get away and not think of the stuff that you had to do day to day, shopping, children, dogs, cats. <laughs> so it was, it was brilliant. I did a lot of walking in, at night time and what I loved about the island was there was no lights. There's no street lights, so you couldn't, you know, so that you really got to see the stars and and you just felt safe. You could walk around in the dark and there was nothing, there was nothing sinister going to happen to you apart from a cow walking into you or something like that. But um, so yeah, I did a lot of drawings at night time, and I never would have, it wouldn't have occurred for me to do that before. And I recorded a lot of sound, and um, so yeah, the solitude just kind of made, made lots of different things possible. Just the space and time to think, which I wouldn't have had before. And it, um, it kind of nourished me for a long time. It actually was a great opportunity, because I don't think I've done anything like that since I was in college. And uh, to just turn everything off with your life and just focus on your art and to have the space to do it. Um, well, I suppose the fact that we were out of reach meant that there was time um, for serious thought and for proper focus and what I found was that when you're truly alone like that you notice a lot more than you would normally when you're you know if you're in town and there's the hustle and bustle of everything that's going on like out there it's quiet it was still it's so beautiful so you suddenly start noticing you know the colors on the particular rock or the way that grass is moving in a field or the noises, um, the way that the mountains look completely different from a different angle, um, reflections in the sand, all of those kind of things that, that may be, you know, if you're a part of a gang out for a walk or something like that, you just don't um, always pick up on those things. It's such an exciting thing the first time that you drive out um, or walk um, and it's a completely different perspective. When you're halfway out across the tidal flats and you look back, you realise that Sligo is surrounded by mountains. And um, it, it is that physical thing of stepping out from your comfort zone, making some sort of like a pilgrimage nearly. And um, it's like sitting backwards when you're on a train. You get a different view of things, you know. And that's good because it, it sort of... It stretches your um, observational skills, and that's what that's what you need to do if you're going to make work. Is you really have to see, you know. So sometimes it's good to get things tipped up. Coney is special. It's the proximity to Sligo and the remoteness at the same time. Um, being able to travel there in a car or a boat, um, but it feels feels very much like the edge of the world, like you could just fall off the edge, it's tidal. Um, so you have these forces of nature working on you when you're there. When we put up the, the posters for the exhibition and we started to speak to people about the idea behind it and the sort of work that we were going to show, it was amazing how many people in Sligo had their own feelings about Coney Island and it's different for everybody and precious to everybody and it's sort of in the middle of the bay overlooked on three sides and so it belongs to everybody and nobody so when you make that trip out 
um, whether you go by boat or whether you walk or whether you, you drive out, that's as important as being there. You're not just dropped in. You have to make an effort to get there. And the trip is quite a considered thing. You have to be careful. So getting to Coney is not an easy thing. And getting to Coney can be, you know, when you get there, you could be in any time. You know, it's kind of, it's a very precious, timeless place. And I always feel when I leave Coney, I haven't left it, I've always brought a bit of it with me. Um, it's just a really special place. And being there with, um, for other female artists and to work together and share the experience, what did that mean to you? There's a lovely sense of community. A sense that we were all um, trying to find what Coney meant to us, each one of us. And um, a beginning to work out there. And that was, that was really lovely. Someone would come back from a walk and say, oh, did you see? Or, um, you know, or in the evening, we, we, there's a small pub there, we went there. And um, it's almost like a living room. And so it was a, a lovely feeling of, of walking, no street lights, walking in the dark to a small one room pub and just talking about our day. And how important is this ongoing exhibition for you now? For a start it was amazing, the exhibition, all of us coming into the room on the Saturday evening and bringing all the work together. And most of it I would have never seen other than bits that were started in Coney. And to see what all of us brought and experienced and produced, and it was stunning. So I think from that point of view, just even to remember that everybody has a different eye and not everybody sees the same as you, and yet we followed the same themes. And then I suppose for myself it was that, again, that space, because I, I had the space to think and then to produce something over the 12 months to sort of look at it and have time to mull it over and then produce something that spoke of what it was to me. rabbit um, and the island is full of them They're everywhere um, but there is a smaller island closer to Sligo very close to Pony called Oyster Island and Oyster is across from my house and that island has hairs on it and I can see these big animals because they're quite they're tall you know I can see them moving on Oyster Island um, very clearly and they're so um, sort of, they're kind of magical things um, and they're so silent and a few times I have seen people coming and gathering these hares to take them from their home, the only place they have ever been um, and take them off to coursing meetings. Um, which is something I, I'm really, I feel very strongly about because they have, they have such resonance um, in Irish mythology. They're a very special sort of creature um, and they're so timid. It just seems such an awful thing to do to take something from its environment and throw it to hounds. But it fed back into um, something that I've been drawing about um, for the last few years, everything I work on seems to come back to the central theme for me which is about home, uh, family, attachment and detachment. So they're very personal sort of issues. Um, and so the hair sort of is the carrier for that sort of symbolism for myself. When I was reading about hairs and, and looking up images and that 
I was really amazed to find out that the hair is only in the nest, or it's not, it's in a form, it's a little hollow in the ground, the mother has the babies, and they are only there for three weeks before they go and they form their own territories. And in that time, the mother visits them once a day. So it's 21 times. But the nature of the quality of her visit, it's sufficient. So it's not about being smothered and having constant attention. Um, if your connection with somebody is good enough, it'll be enough to launch you, you know. So, and um, my own mother, we always call her Mammy, you know, so Mammy 21 times, the 21 visits. Maybe could you say a few words about your piece, Gira Ilon? Uh, Gira Ilon, that's um, the island hair. And that piece is um, an amalgam of things that I've carried around for a long time, probably mostly since we were on the island and we did the residency. Um, there is, behind the hare's face, there is a drawing that I did uh, after we came off the island um, of a hare and its eye. And the drawing was unfinished, but I never got rid of it, and every so often it would turn up in a pile of drawings that I'd be going through. Um, the frame I bought a long time ago for a euro, but I liked it and I thought it might be an important thing, so that was stored in the shed. And the hare's face, it's an actual hare's face, I got it in a fishing tackle shop in Galway. And it was a very um, unsettling thing to see all these masks of hares stacked up. And I began to wonder why, well, they have them for tying flies. Um, for fishing. But I began to wonder about the person that has to do that. What sort of a job is that to take the hairs off, or the faces off hairs, uh, for a living and dry them out and sell them? Um, and that all sort of fed into the idea of masks and what's, you know, what's behind, what's behind the face, what's behind the person that has to go and do that sort of a job. Uh, why do we pick up things, you know, stones on the beach or you know, we collect little things and we keep them because they're important and sometimes they kind of come together and they make sense and for me that piece um, kind of, it's engaging because you see people going up to look at it and they're not really quite sure what it is and then they realise that there's a drawing behind the hair's mask and kind of look in, look around and see what it is so that's my favourite piece from the work that I have here um, and uh, I think it's quite uh, Strong. I think everybody that looks at it kind of takes something else from it, you know. Your paintings are all centered around um, the old building on the island. Um, it seems as if you were breathing life into it. What significance does this building have to you? Um, when I was on the island, the building, I felt that that has kept calling me back, calling me back to it. It's called um, the Flood House. I call it the Flood House. Local people call it Flood's House. Um, I've also heard it called the Bleak House. Um, Joseph Flood would have been the last person to live in it about 80 years ago, I think. Um, but it's 250 years old and it's been standing there all that time. It's quite majestic and proud and defiant looking. Um, it's one of the first things you meet when you get to the island. Um, I think one of the things that really appealed to me in the house was because a lot of my work has been centred on themes of courage, fearlessness, determination, particularly in the work that I do around portraiture. And I felt that this house actually held those qualities as well. Um, you know, kind of add to that endurance, longevity, um, even stamina, you know, that it's withstood all these years and these centuries of, of wild weather and a lack of care and, you know, people coming and going, animals tramping through the grounds. Um, and it's still very, very beautiful. Um, it's, for me, whilst I was working on the paintings, the more that I drew it, 
the more they become less landscapes and, and more portraits. Um, and I do feel now that I've created a series of portraits of this house, um, that it's something that has a, a presence and a character as a person would. Um, so I guess the relationship between us is building and it has become quite, you know, like, like a relationship between a, a person and, a, and, and the artist rather than cold stone. I use oils and I use them very thinly. So um, for these images I would have been working from partly from photographs and partly from drawings that, um, that I took, that I, that I made when I was on and off the island actually. Um, but when I come to paint one of the images, um, I do work quite a lot on the composition first and make quite a lot of decisions about what it is that I actually want to be on the canvas and how I want it to look. But then when the process gets going, it's actually something that's quite fluid um, and I'm responding a lot to the paint as it goes onto the canvas and to what happens to the paint as, as, it's, you know, as it washes across the canvas. The, I was talking to you before a little bit about the idea of longevity and endurance and the process that I've used for all of these is that I would put on the image and then wash it off and I put it on again and I wash it off again and I put it on again and wash it off. So you'll gradually layers and layers build up because each time there's a little bit that gets left behind and you can see in the images, some, sometimes there are shadows of those little pieces that have get, gotten left behind and the, the new image that's gone on top has landed in a slightly different place. But that's something that I actually quite enjoy in those paintings because it starts to shift a little bit and you get a bit of movement so it's not as cold and solid as it might have been otherwise. So really it is a process of using them not entirely like watercolours but the kind of the, the thinness and the transparencies wouldn't be unlike painting with watercolours. But it really is um, a matter of building up layer after layer after layer and then right at the end being um, a little bit more specific about the details that go in on top. So you like the idea of losing control a little bit in Always. the process? <laughs> Always. Um, I like it to be... Uh, not a battle, but I would say maybe a discussion between me and the canvas that, that I have an intention and then the reality of what happens um, following that intention might be something slightly different or might be something surprising, something new or different might happen. And then it's what do I do with it? How do I respond to it? And what's my next move? And then that follows on and on and on until at some point, um, I reach a point when I, I just know that that's it, it's done. Um, and that could take maybe one week to get there or it could take four weeks to get there. What was your um, main inspiration on the island? I suppose for me it was time. You know, time, the effect that time has on a place and people. And that's a theme I use in a lot of the work I do. Just what time does, and the tide, and the time, and the regular intervals of the tide went in and out was part of one of the, the um, themes that I was following, and also what time does to things, what's left out, like the erosion, or a drip on, the, on, uh, on rocks that leaves a mark, or um, just the whole feeling of the Atlantic hitting against this island, and it still stood the test of time, and, even just the journey over, um, you know, to, to time it right. You know, we had to be organised and ready and go out at the right time. And, and even that was scary. And probably one of the themes of my work is that whole journey and timing things properly and watching the time and observing nature and what's around you. And I suppose that was all part of it. Did you create any of your drawings over there? Yes, yes, I did. Um, the only colour piece I actually have in the exhibition was Dan Coney. And I suppose that in itself was a transition because my, in the real 
nine to five uh, part of my life, I am a graphic designer and illustrator, and a lot of my work is colour. I do a lot of painting for um, a company in America, and it's all very colour related, and you're always watching trends, and you're always six months ahead, and colour is so important to my job. So then, I suppose that was the finished piece on the island that was my, where I came to the island with. And then everything after that was black and white, just drawing. Not quite everything, but uh, it began to, colour began to leave, only little bits of colour, and then right down to the basics, which is probably part of my journey. Get back to basics, start with what I always love to do, which is to draw, and pen and paper, and pencil and charcoal are the mediums that I have gotten, that I loved so much, so that pretty much is most of the work I have in the exhibition at the moment, so. Lauren, can you say a few words about your work, what you call these paintings or sculptures? Um, I'd call them painting, but before we hung the show, I started to see them as three-dimensional objects. Um, I was going to hang them singly, singularly on the wall and uh, they have a very three-dimensional quality to them. But when you're working in a series <coughs> of a load of them all at one go, it kind of hadn't, hadn't occurred to me that way. But when you're picking them out one by one, they definitely, um, just with the texture, they have a sculptural quality to them. Can you say a few words about the technique and the materials you are using? Yeah. Um, it's called encaustic painting and um, it's a very ancient technique that the Greeks used. And I saw a painting by Jasper Johns when I was in my 20s in New York, um, one of the American flag paintings that he did, and it was an encaustic painting. And I was completely mesmerized by it. I just loved it. And um, I've always been reading about encaustic paintings since, and I've tried to do it, but I could never get the recipe right. And then I met um, an artist, Helen Comfort, who's an encaustic painter here in Ireland. She's based in Kilkenny. And um, she gave me great guidance in, uh, in just the basics, how to start off and what equipment needed and everything. And um, I loved it. It's a great fast way of working. And uh, so you, make, you mix pigment in with beeswax and um, you apply heat. That's what encaustic means, it means to burn. So you're fusing layer upon layer and you can build up to as many layers as you want and you can scratch into it and print over it and it's, uh, it's a very forgiving medium. My work is very much process based. So um, I, it's not really about the finished product, I, it's more what I'm doing at the moment is really what excites me. And uh, with the encaustic painting, I, I, my background is in textiles, printed textiles, so I, um, techniques that I'd learned years ago were just coming back to me with stenciling and uh, layering, um, which are all part of print. Um, and then you can draw on top of it as well. So yeah, if, it's, it's using a lot of uh, skills that I had had in the past that I'd forgotten about. What inspired you most on the island and um, how did you capture this in your work? Um, there was a few separate things. One of the things was the, I love the textures on the island, uh, the, the rust, like what the environment had done to the buildings, the old ruins on the island, um, you know, the corrugated roofs that had just beautiful colours of brown. So I used, I used a lot of browns then in the work. Um, and the concrete with the moss on it, so kind of greys, greeny greys. So they, they, they were colours that kind of influenced me. And um, I liked the barbed wire. There's a lot of, you know, a lot of fences that were just collapsing. And in a lot of the encaustic paintings, I was scratching those kind of crosses. They were like mini crucifixes all lined up in a row. Um, and another thing I started doing since then, I've continued now, so like a year later, uh, there were certain parts on the island when I went for a walk that kind of resonated with me. And I'd stop and I took a compass reading on my phone. So I took longitude and latitude and I documented that in my diary and the time of day or the time of night, whatever. And I recorded sound at that point. 
Um, so I call, I call that degrees of happiness. And I so with on the work there's um, there's different. I've got times recorded and degrees, uh, longitude and latitude, and same thing kind of intersections, uh, you know, lines crossing. So it's kind of a, a combination of that and barbed wire, but um, just the image of the cross just kind of kept uh, occurring uh, in diff different forms, even though I'm not religious, but it just, it's interesting, I think, how it, um, it keeps coming back, that imagery keeps coming back to the work. And also, uh, I used, or I, yeah, I went for, like I said, went for walks, and I found different objects, just washed up on the, on the beach, and uh, my favourite was this big piece of lino that I found, and uh, I, I had it on here, I didn't know what I was going to do with it. So then, when I started working in the wax, it's easy to embed objects into it and work around it and keep building up layers. And so I did a piece, um, and I called it uh, Flotsam, I think. And um, when I showed it to my mother, it was the same piece of lino that she had in her flat in the 60s in Dublin. So it's a happy coincidence, or I don't know, maybe things aren't coincidental at all. <laughs> Can you say what inspired you most? Um, I love the sea, I love the movement, um, the sound of it, the smell of it. Um, and I love the, the, um, the blackness of the earth. And these things contrasted to each other, I really love that. But I do love, I do love not only the sea, but I love the mountains and the, um, the boggy landscape. I like not only looking at a landscape from a distance, of the vastness of it, but I like close-ups too, of looking at something that's very minute and very small at your feet, perhaps. Can you say a few words about the technique that you use for your paintings? I like to work with pigments and um, add binder, whether egg tempera or watercolor binder or acrylic binder, and bake them into paint and work with these. And I'd like to do that because you can just be very experimental. You can paint and wash it off and repaint. And, um, and also, um, you make a choice of which colors you're going to use from the beginning. You don't make up 20 colors, you make up seven or eight. And um, I think this process of, of, of letting things happen, of, of retracing your steps that you made someplace else, that all this experience just feeds into your work. So your work is a very um, organic, process and every painting is an experiment or an experience in itself? Yes, it's, it's almost like re-experiencing where you've been. You have a sense of place, a sense of landscape. And in painting a landscape, um, all of a sudden all these experiences begin to, to come to the forefront and, and you see them again and, and re-experience them. And in these two sea paintings, I um, like to paint on a hard surface. And I usually use um, a substance that is um, used to fill cracks in the wall. It's very light. It dries very quickly and I put this on the surface, let it dry, and then I put my painting ground on. And the painting ground has sand in it, very fine sand. And then I mix my colors and um, um, decide what the underpainting is going to be. So actually there is a little bit of thought before in these works. And um, I used ochre which is yellow, 
uh, an earth color and painted a large area with it and then um, I painted various shades of green on uh, top of this and two shades of white which I painted very quickly and um, in some cases even poured the paint across the surface. And then I uh, manipulated that um, with a brush and um, added certain dark areas over the stones, the cliffs, the rocks, and then began to work on the water. So it's, it was, it's very difficult to paint a wave breaking because you have to paint two parts at the same time, the water and actually the foam of the breaking wave. Um, and so you have to be very quick, which is great. I love ultramarine blue. It has such brilliancy and depth. And uh, I love green. And so here's a real chance to let these, these wonderful colors play. Just zoom across the work.